Mount Tom, Nicholas Flamel said, falling to his knees, breathing in great lungfuls of warm air. San Francisco. Dizzy and disoriented, Josh too stumbled to his hands and knees and looked around. While there was still brilliant sunshine on the mountainside, swirling tendrils of mist were creeping in farther down the slopes. Sophie crouched beside her brother. Her flesh was chalky white, her eyes sunk deep in her head, her blonde hair flat and greasy on her skull. How do you feel? About as bad as you look, I'm guessing, he answered. Sophie climbed slowly to her feet, then helped her twin up. Where are we? she asked, looking around. But there were no landmarks she recognized. North of San Francisco, I believe, he said. A shape moved below them, sending the mist billowing in great sweeping curves. The trio turned to face the figure, knowing that if it was an enemy, they had nothing left to fight it with. They were too tired to even run. Paranel Flamel appeared, looking poised and elegant, even though she was dressed in a dirty black coat over a coarse shirt and trousers. I've been waiting here for ages, she called, a huge smile on her face as she strode up the hillside. The sorceress wrapped her arms around the twins, squeezing them tightly. Oh, but it's good to see you safe and well. I've been so worried. She touched the bruises on Sophie's cheek, a scrape on Josh's forehead, the cuts on his arm. They both felt a tingling, crawling heat, and Josh actually watched the bruises fade from his sister's flesh. It's good to be back, Josh said. Sophie nodded in agreement. It's good to see you again, Perry. Nicholas gathered his wife into his arms, holding her tight for what seemed like a long time. Then he stepped back, his hands on her shoulders, and looked at her critically. You are looking good, my love, he said. Admit it, I'm looking odd, she said. Then her green eyes moved across his face, noting the new lines and deep creases in his skin. Her index finger trailed white aura across his numerous cuts and bruises, healing them. So not as old as you. You are a decade younger, she reminded him. For today, she smiled. For the first time in all our years together, you do look older than me. It's been an interesting few days, Flamel admitted. But how did you get here? The last time we spoke, you were a prisoner on Alcatraz. I cannot claim to be one of the few prisoners to have escaped the rock. She, slipping her arm into his, she walked him down the mountain through the early afternoon mist, the twins following a few steps behind. You should be very proud of me, Nicholas, she said. I drove here all by myself. I am always proud of you. He paused. But we don't have a car. I borrowed a rather nice Thunderbird convertible I found at the pier. I knew the owner wouldn't be using it any time soon. Dr. John D. lay in the soft grass and looked up at the night sky, watching the gold and silver glow fade from the heavens and smelling, even from this distance, the hint of vanilla and orange. Police helicopters vibrated in the air, and sirens sounded everywhere. So the twins and Flamel had escaped, and they had taken with them his life and his future. He had been living on borrowed time since the failed attack the previous night. Now he was a dead man walking. The magician sat up slowly, cradling his right arm. It felt numb from fingertip to shoulder, where it had taken the full force of the blow from Corrent. He thought it might be broken. Clarent. He had seen the boy throw the sword, but he hadn't seen him pick it up. Dee rolled over in the mud and discovered the blade lying on the ground next to him. Gently, almost reverently, he lifted it out of the dirt and then lay back on the earth, the blade flat on his chest, both hands resting across the hilt. Five hundred years he had been searching for this weapon. It was a quest that had taken him all over the world and into the Shadow Realms. He laughed, the sound high-pitched, almost hysterical, and he had finally found it back almost where it started. 
One of the first places he had looked for the blade was under the altar stone at Stonehenge. He had been 15 years old at the time, and Henry VIII had been on the throne. Still lying on the ground, Dee reached under his coat and pulled out Excalibur, holding it in his right hand. Then he raised both weapons aloft. The swords moved in his grasp, twitching toward one another, the round hilts rotating, blades gently smoking. An icy chill started up one side of his body. A searing warmth flowed up the other side. His aura popped alight, steaming off his flesh in long yellow tendrils, and he felt his aches fade, his cuts and bruises heal. The magician brought the two swords close, blade crossing blade. And then they suddenly snapped together, as if magnetized. He tried to pull them apart, but they slotted together, fitting on into the other, then clicked and fused, blade to blade, hilt to hilt, to create a single, rather ordinary-looking sword that leaked gray smoke. A figure shuffled out of the darkness. An old man bundled up at dozens of coats. Yellow light danced off his wild hair and unkempt beard, and his bright blue eyes were lost and distant. He looked at the sword, focusing, concentrating, remembering. He reached out with one trembling finger to stroke the cold stone, then his eyes filled with tears. The two that are one, he mumbled. The one that is all. Then the Ancient of Days turned and shuffled off into the night.